Welcome back to the Algarve. I'm very happy with my Transalp, but no bike is perfect. So as Honda prepare to launch the bike in Australia and the United States, here are a few good and bad points that I've noted after two months of riding mine. I've had my notepad in the garage for the past few weeks so that every time I thought of something I could jot it down. So let's dive in. Let's do the negatives first so that we can finish on the positives. Only fair really as this is genuinely a good honest bike that I enjoy. Now I won't be including the big negatives that everyone's been moaning about ever since Honda first announced the bike back in uh, Italy last November at Eichmer. I'm referring here of course to the tube tyres, the bolt on rear subframe or welded on subframe and the lack of cruise control because while I agree that they are negatives We've all known about these for months, they were never deal breakers for me, and I was fully aware of them when I signed the order form. Now, this video lists the top annoyances, in reverse order of irritation, that I've discovered while actually using the bike. So, starting off the list at number 14, the least annoying, tyre noise. Widely reported in user groups, so this would appear to be a common problem. I have the Metzler Carew Street tyres, according to my deal of the Dunlops that were also offered at launch, have been phased out now and all Transalps will be getting Metzlers from now on. And they made a droning noise between about 110 and 120 kilometres an hour, about 70 miles an hour. It must have been pretty loud because I could definitely hear it all the time through my helmet with all the wind noise at that speed and it was very annoying as it was bang on normal motorway cruising speeds. My Honda ADV350 scooter has exactly the same tyres, albeit smaller diameter, and I've never had a problem. This could well have been my number one dislike, but the noise mysteriously disappeared at around a thousand kilometres, and I haven't heard it since. No idea why or how, but if you've just taken delivery of a Transalp and are annoyed by the droning at 110 kilometres an hour, just wait a couple of weeks and it will hopefully disappear. Number 13, the uncomfortable seat. It's not a problem I've found to be fair, but a number of owners have complained that the seat is too hard. I did my 1000 km trip down to Gibraltar, no problem. It's obviously no Rolls Royce, but that's part of the motorcycling experience, isn't it? Number 12, the ugly face. I knew about this, of course, when I bought the bike, but it doesn't really get any better with time. The headlight's too small aesthetically, and by all accounts, I don't ride after dark, so I haven't been able to check for myself. Not particularly effective at night. It's a parts bin special, and Honda used the light from the smaller CB500X. Thing is, the Transalp is a more imposing bike, and this headlight doesn't really work. I think the one from the NT1100 or even my ADV would have worked better. And the next one, the tyre valves aren't the 90 degree type, a microscopic saving, but I suppose when Mr Honda is making millions of these bikes, every penny helps. It's not a huge problem of course, especially with the 21 inch front wheel at the front leaving plenty of space, but they're just so much more convenient than these straight valves. Number 10, the split fuel tank. There's a sort of baffle inside, presumably to stop the fuel sloshing around too much, but it's awkward to get the nozzle down inside the tank, and then when that part's full, you have to sort of retract the nozzle halfway to fill the top bit of the tank. A bit annoying. Number nine, the left hand switch gear. It's not backlit, it's a bit ugly, the horn and indicators are inverted, and it's not especially intuitive when moving through the otherwise excellent dash menus. The switch gear has been lifted from the ADV350, which I've been riding for 18 months, so I was quick to adapt to the button layout, but they don't feel particularly nice to press. Number eight, the fit and finish. This is generally excellent. Of course, it's a Honda, everything is where it should be. The wires are neatly tucked away. Very nice paint finish, at least on this white gloss. I'm not sure how the matte paint on the other two color options will fare. There are just a couple of areas where a bit of penny pinching is in evidence. The handlebar clamp looks and feels a bit cheap, especially compared to my Triumphs or even the ADV for that matter. And these holes on the rear rack haven't been countersunk and the edges are a bit sharp. Other than that, it's fine. Number seven, I wish the engine had a bit more torque. Of course, I'm spoilt with the Speed Twin 1200, but I'm a self-confessed torque junkie and always like a bit of beef down low. 
The Transalp is fine in a different league to the CB500X, but I'd still like a few newton meters for a more relaxed cruise. The Suzuki 800DE is supposed to be better, as I will hopefully find out for myself as soon as my local dealer gets his demo bike prepped. The rear brake's good, but the front brake is lacking in bite. I could probably resolve this with some sintered pads, but then the already significant fork dive would be even more pronounced, so I think I'll leave it. The brakes are fine and more, they're more than up to the job of stopping the bike, but in the same way that I enjoy unnecessarily huge amounts of torque, I do like knowing I have the ridiculous stopping power of a top spec Brembo setup. Again, something I could remedy if I really wanted to. Number 5. More power. 92 horsepower is fine, most of the time, but for me personally, on any bike, the sweet spot is around 120-130 horsepower. Now I'm not saying you'd use that very often on a mid-size adventure bike, but like over-the-top brakes, it's always nice to know that you have it if you need it. Think of it like this, if you ever use full throttle on a bike, you know, when you've twisted the right hand grip as far as it will go to the bump stop, then almost by definition you need more power. I use full throttle all the time on my ADV, hardly ever on my Speed Twin, and regularly on the Transalp. Another 30 horsepower please Honda. At number 4 I'm going to put the slightly agricultural sound from the engine. Now I've heard worse, but compared to the very loud but paradoxically buttery smooth noise from my 1200cc Triumph Speed Twin, the Transalp can seem a bit rough especially when it's hot and you're changing speed in traffic all the time. It's quite difficult to record engine noise on the road, but this was recorded in the garage when the engine was cold, just to give you an idea. Number 3, as with many Euro 5 bikes, low speed fueling isn't the best, it can be a bit jerky around town, although putting the bike in rain mode does help. Standard and Sport, the two modes I use 99% of the time, give pretty much the same results in terms of roughness. Strange as I didn't really notice this on the identically engined Honda 750. It's not bad, but again I've heard the Suzuki 800DE is better in this regard. Number two is going to have to be the vibrations. Now the Transalp is better than the CB500X, but there's still room for improvement. I would have thought that in this day and age there would be some way of effectively isolating the handlebars and the foot pegs from the vibrations that come from the engine and the road without adversely affecting the feel. As it is, I've put uh, grip puppies on the grips and some rubber pads on the foot peg hinges as the right peg in particular is prone to buzziness. Number one pet hate then, and I'll freely admit this is a massive first world problem, but bear with me. It's the lack of fuel range on the TFT dash. All I'm really interested in while I'm riding like this out on the open road is my speed and how long before I have to think about finding a fuel station. That's it. I don't really care about engine temperature or how many litres of fuel I've used since I set off this morning or even if I'm honest how many revs the engine's doing or what gear I'm in. I just assumed fuel range was a given nowadays. I have it on my scooter and my Speed Twin and as far as I can remember, just about every other bike I've bought in the last 10 years. Okay, you get a fuel gauge of course, but even this is annoying. You get six bricks, the first one of which only goes out after about 150 kilometers and then the others fall like dominoes every 20 kilometers. You also get every conceivable way of presenting fuel usage, like how many litres you've used since the reserve kicked in, what use is that, but no range. But the most annoying thing is that instead of giving us range, Honda thought it would be a good idea to provide a novel feature that I've never seen on any other bike, grip angle. Now when I first saw this in the menus, I thought that Honda's engineers had somehow found a way of calculating how much lean angle you had left before you lost grip, but unfortunately it's far more prosaic. Grip angle, ladies and gentlemen, tells you how many degrees you are twisting the throttle. That's it. 
Nought to 68 degrees. How fascinating, how useful. Literally seconds of fun watching, watching that, eh? I always thought having lean angle displayed on my BMW F900XR was of questionable value, but wrist angle? Nah, don't give them fuel range. They can calculate it for themselves and just stick grip angle in the space range would go. Now, I get it, Honda. I know you want us all to buy the Africa Twin, and I know that's why the Transalp doesn't get cruise control or tubeless tyres, but not giving us fuel range is just plain stupid, and grip angle is frankly rubbing salt into the wound, so please, Honda, correct this in your next software update. Okay, rant's over. Let's have a look at the many positives of the Transalp 750. In at number 15, the exhaust note. Surprisingly meaty for a stock exhaust on a Euro 5 adventure bike. Pity it's often drowned out by the less appealing engine note, but I'll still take it. No need to change the factory end can here, unless you want something that's more agreeable to look at. Number 14, the Transalp feels nimble, not to say downright sporty, much better than the CB500X and dare I say it, the Africa Twin 2, which feels ponderous in comparison. On roads like this, the 21-inch front wheel genuinely feels like a 19, while of course still retaining the ability of a larger diameter rim to glide serenely over bumps and potholes. I notice this particularly because my scooter sits on the 15-inch front, while the Speed Twin has 17s front and rear. Now, while smaller wheels do generally equate to sharper handling, they can feel skittish, and on the scooter especially, you feel every irregularity on the road surface. The Transalp suffers from none of this, great stability from the 21-inch front, relaxed fork rate, softish suspension, and long wheelbase. It affords you a very comfortable, relaxing, but sporty ride. Next one is the space under the seat. Now, you're not going to get much camping gear under there, but there's enough room for the essentials like a first aid kit, disc lock, multi-tool and document pouch, which isn't bad by today's standards. And I nearly always have my tank bag on anyway for larger things like water bottle, wallet and house keys. Next positive and in at number 12 are the mirrors. The view behind is excellent and they don't vibrate at all, ever. And that's all I have to say about that. Number 11. I like the bare bones approach to the Transalp that Honda's taken. It's a lightweight bike, it's competitively priced, and one of the reasons for this is because you don't get much in the way of accessories. And I like it that way. I like the fact that I can start with a blank canvas and add the equipment that I need and the accessories that I want. Honda's, Honda's Spain and Portugal were offering a free quick shifter on bikes ordered in the first week after launch, which was great because that was about the only factory option I wanted. And it is great, by the way, more on the quick shifter in a few minutes. My dealer also gave me 400 euros worth of accessories. Ask nicely and I'm sure she'll be as generous with you. But to be honest, it wasn't that easy choosing from the catalogue because I didn't really need anything. I ended up taking the radiator guard, which I don't particularly like because it's silver instead of a more discreet black and it has a silly logo on it but it does protect the radiator a bit, and as it's OEM, if there should ever be an overheating problem, they won't be able to say it's because the aftermarket guard I put on restricted the airflow. Anyway, I chose a few more accessories up to the 400 euro value, like these wind deflectors, which seem very effective, heated grips, which I've yet to try, and a 12 volt socket, which I may well never try. And then I began looking at other manufacturers for things like luggage and crash, crash protection. I did a video a couple of weeks ago on the Hepco and Becca lower crash bars and the Barkbuster handguards that I've fitted. And hopefully in my next video, I'll be able to show you the skid plate, luggage and other bits and pieces that SW Motec and Hepco and Becca have promised to send me. Which brings me on to number 10 in my favourite things about the Transalp, the availability of accessories. This is, or is set to be, a very popular motorcycle around the world. So there is, or at least there will be over the coming months, a plethora of toys to choose from. Hard cases, soft panniers, semi-hard tail bags, tank bags, skid plates, touring screens, deflectors, crash bars, you name it, you will have it for the Transalp sooner or later. And this isn't necessarily something you can say about some of the competitors. Number nine is the riding modes, more specifically the fact that this is probably the first bike I've ever ridden, certainly owned, 
where I can immediately feel a definite difference between the different modes. Standard is standard, sport I use when I'm feeling frisky, rain is not used very often in the Algarve, and gravel is for off-road. The feeling through your right hand chart changes markedly and each mode is genuinely useful. Only two things I'm not too keen on. The fact that the various settings within each mode, uh, traction control, power delivery, ABS, etc., take up a lot of space on the relatively small but legibly TFT, legible TFT dash, and the fact that the traction control in gravel mode is very intrusive, sometimes to the point of preventing forward motion if you're on an incline like this, for example. Good news though, you can configure your own preferences in user mode, so I've set up my own gravel mode with slightly less traction control and that works fine. Number eight, the looks. I don't care what you naysayers say, apart from the silly little headlight that I discussed in the negatives, I think this is a really nice looking bike. Okay, it's no Panigale or even Speed Twin, but for an adventure bike, it's okay, especially in white, but of course that's subjective. There's no beak, it doesn't look too heavy, it's well proportioned, it's got gold rims, original but relatively subtle graphics, yeah, I like it. Number seven, fuel consumption. Now, Honda are always good at this, but I'm averaging about 4.3 litres per 100 kilometres, which is good for a 750cc and falls smack between my ADV 350, 3.5 litres, and my Speed Twin, 5.1 litres per 100 kilometres. I tend to ride all three in roughly the same way in terms of aggressiveness, so I think this is a good comparison table. Number six in the positives has to be the acceleration. Now, I mentioned in the negatives that I would like a bit more power, but to be fair, acceleration up to about 150 kilometers an hour or 90 miles an hour is very good, certainly more than enough for the public roads, and it easily trounces, trounces the CB500X, whose lack of top-end power was always my number one gripe. It's beyond 150, 90 miles an hour, when I nip across the border to Germany, that I can feel the engine hasn't got much more to give. But at lesser speeds, it's got decent punch. Number five, the build quality. Up to usual Honda standards here, especially the paintwork, and apart from the slightly poorly finished rear rack and handlebar clamp I mentioned in the negatives, quality is really very good. Number four, the quick shifter. Now, if you only specify one factory option, I would urge you to go for this. It's one of the sweetest shifters I've ever tried on any bike, and it can even be configured for harshness in the menu. I've set both my up and down shifts to soft, and the result is astonishingly smooth. At least it is once you've learned how to use it. Keep on the throttle for up shifts, and then almost completely off for down shifts, and you'll be away. I don't use it that often, maybe 20% of all gear changes, as perhaps stupidly I do feel sorry for the gearbox and prefer to help it out a bit with a squeeze of my left hand, which incidentally is very easy given the lightness of the clutch, another plus point. Now quick shifters are of course totally unnecessary on the road, but they're great fun, and this one is so good that I now regret not having one on my Speed Twin. Number three, something that's very important to me in southern Portugal is engine heat, as it can get very hot down here. When I was researching adventure bikes last year, I quickly discounted the Multistrada and Tiger 900 because of the amount of heat the engine and radiator throws, off, throws at your legs on these bikes. It's great in the winter, but I wear these Revit Eclipse vented trousers from about May to October when it's 30 to 36 degrees that's hot for Europeans, on a regular basis, and any extra heat getting through the mesh onto my legs from the engine is a most unwelcome addition. Number two, wind and rain protection. Now I got caught in a couple of downpours in the mountains on my way to Gibraltar a few weeks ago, and I was surprised by just how dry I stayed. I hadn't taken any wet weather gear, and I had my iPhone on the handlebars exposed to the elements, but we all stayed remarkably dry. Wind protection is similarly impressive for such a short windscreen. Yes, the dealer did fit these optional side deflectors to the screen and upper fairing as part of their sweetener package, but I discovered that overall protection was actually better without the top deflector that I borrowed from my scooter. Aerodynamics is a bit of a dark art involving a lot of trial and error, and I've read in user groups that the optional touring screen from Honda can actually increase turbulence to the top of the helmet with taller riders 
So I'm sticking with the standard low screen plus deflector kit as it seems to work very well for my 187 centimeters or six foot one and a half. Before I get on to the number one, just a quick word about my last video about better alternatives to full height crash bars. A handful of viewers suggested that my solution of lower crash bars plus reinforced handguards wouldn't be any, any use because bikes fall with the handlebars off center. Well, motorcycle bars don't turn through 90 degrees plus as they do on a bicycle. And if they're pulled in towards the rider at the moment of impact, which I would guess is 50% of the time, any slack is more than compensated for by the protrusion of the handguards. So I think we're okay. Second thing, the road skin riding jeans I showcased in the same video are proving popular. So if you're interested, they are extremely comfortable and I can thoroughly recommend them. And don't forget the 10% discount that is still valid at the time of making of this video that you can get by following the link in the description and using the code ROCKETMAN at checkout. Anyway, to the number one pleasant surprise about the Transalp. Simple, it's the overall comfort, which is precisely what I bought the bike for. Compliant suspension, comfortable seat with room to move back and forth, relatively upright bust with just the right amount of wrist pressure on the handlebars, which themselves are just the right distance from the rider and the right width. Foot pegs are nice and squishy and positioned so that my legs are at just the right angle to maintain good control while still avoiding cramp. The suspension is compliant, verging on the soft, as I say. Not always a good thing, but certainly nice on long motorway cruises. And combined with the big 21 inch front wheel that glides over bumps and potholes, the Transalp is the most comfortable bike I've ever owned and quite possibly one of the most comfortable I've ever ridden. So well done Honda. Now, if you could just give us that fuel range. Anyway, that's it for today. Let me know in the comments what you think of your new Transalp, if you've got one. See you after the summer break for the next video. And as always, thanks for watching.